Hello and welcome to this uh, November 16th, 2017 virtual roundtable at Idaho Commerce. Uh, today we have Catherine Omberg from the housing company to discuss uh, her program and um, give us some information on housing and some different examples of what they've done in different communities. Uh, as always, these are uh, recorded, so you will be able to access it at a later date if you like, or to share it with any of um, anyone who may have some interest. And on that note, we are working on getting these recordings um, on our website, so look for changes there in the future. Um, and with that, I will hand things over to Catherine. Well, thank you, Amanda, and good afternoon. I'm excited to be here today to talk about two of my favorite topping, topics, the state of Idaho and housing, particularly affordable housing. Um, so I work for the housing company. I am the director, and the housing company is uh, Jenny and Amanda asked me just to talk a little bit about um, who the housing company is, <laughs> Uh, what we do, what our mission is, different types of pro projects that we've done around the state, as well as discuss some of the different housing, affordable housing programs that are available out there and how you might um, look to either advocate or access some of these in your community to help solve some of your housing problems that you have out there. Because I know they are pretty rampant, not only around the state, in rural and urban communities but around the country as well so so who is the housing company the housing company is um, a private nonprofit corporation we've been around for 27 years we are an affiliate corporation to idaho housing and finance association they created the housing company to achieve um, their affordable housing objectives around the state uh, like happens in a lot of in a lot of states that have a large rural population, all the re resources go to the larger urban areas and become concentrated um, to the more um, populated geographic centers. And some of the more outlying and rural communities um, kind of get left left out. Um, of course, developers go where the money is, and so that's a natural thing that can happen. But the housing company was created to help spread things around and, and better allocate resources around the state, some areas that were um, were not getting, um, getting served. So you can see on the slide that there are um, a lot of communities around the state that the housing company has either done new construction of affordable rental housing developments or we have done preservation of existing housing developments. So we have properties from Sandpoint and Priest River to Ashton, St. Anthony and Rexburg and Driggs on the east side of the state to Weezer on the west side of the state. So we're pretty active across the board around the state. Our mission statement, and I'll read this because it, it is um, our mission statement, and the housing company is dedicated to providing rental housing options for Idaho families. Our mission is to help our residents achieve individual and family goals and to foster community pride by providing and managing apartment communities which offer affordable rents and desirable living conditions. And how do we do that? The housing company focuses on three main areas, and that is new development, property management, and preservation. And um, through our new development, we do have some developments that we've done in the larger communities like Twin Falls. But then we also try to, as our first priority, focus on underserved areas and limited access markets. And so we do have expertise in all stages of development from assessing needs for affordable housing in a community to conceptualizing and accessing available funding programs, both public and private, um, to, um, to the design and construction, and then ultimately lease up and property management. And we have used um, a variety of housing um, funding sources to do this, um, low-income housing tax credits, home funds, historic tax credits, housing trust funds, um, just to name a few, and I will talk more specifically about some of those, some of those later. 
but through those um, through those programs, we've developed more than 800 units in um, nearly two dozen affordable rental communities. So on property management, the housing company does um, manage its own affordable housing portfolio as well as doing third-party property management for other affordable owners. We don't manage any market rate properties. We specialize in affordable um, in affordable housing because most of these resources come with pretty strict guidelines on compliance and how they're managed and how you income qualify the people who live there and how you report and meet all of the program guidelines, et cetera. So that is kind of a niche market. Um, there's just a few people that, that do that type of work. And then we also focus on preservation. So we are always looking at and have acquired um, um, existing affordable properties that may be at risk of losing their affordability due to an owner um, selling it or converting it to market. And we um, are active in and looking to acquire those types of properties and preserve their affordability. So one of the things um, that Jenny Hemley asked me to talk about a little bit was what is the difference between larger projects and smaller rural infill projects. And the reason that that's um, kind of important is because there's different funding sources or resources available depending on um, what the community's needs are and, and what kind of project can, could be built in the community. And so a larger project, and these are just very, very general type numbers, but I would say 20 units or more. Now in a lot of states, that, that's very small. And even for us, 20 units is very small, but that's sort of the threshold that you have to get to in order to access the low-income housing tax credit. And low-income housing tax credits are an IRS program. They are not a HUD program. And so and um, they are basically um, a direct credit on someone's tax return, a dollar for do dollar, not a deduction, but a direct credit. And so a developer like us um, applies to Idaho Housing and Finance Association. They are the allocating agency for the state of Idaho. Um, I'll, I'll clarify, um, I'm sure since most all of you um, work in the kind of state realm of business, but Idaho Housing is not a state agency. In a lot of states, the state housing finance agency is a state agency. In Idaho, it is not. It is an independent 501c3 corporation that manages the state's housing, affordable housing resources. So, so they get um, home funds for most areas in the state except Pocatello and Ada County. Um, and they get the low-income housing tax credits for the entire state as well as other types of funding. So, so it's a very competitive process. You um, apply for these tax credits and then once you get them, you sell them for equity that you use to build your project. And usually the equity equates to about 70% of your total costs. And then the other 30% gap you fill through other avenues such as conventional debt or um, other HUD funding sources or other um, community partnerships or, or other types of things. And so Idaho puts out an allocation plan every year and they have a very um, specific scoring criteria. You can find that on um, Idaho Housing's website under multifamily finance if anyone were interested in looking at, at any of the things I'm talking about today, they're on there. But for 2018, their allocation plan has extra points for these priority counties, Ada, Bannock, Bonneville, Canyon, Nez Perce, and Twin Falls. And so for next year, if you're not in one of those counties, the process is so competitive, it is, will be a bit difficult to produce any housing in those communities, but that's an area where in the future, people in, in um, communities around the state that have a real demonstrated need for housing can um, do a little lobbying to get their areas included if, if they feel that they are so inclined to do that. So that's basically how larger projects get built. Um, small rural infill projects, I think, is probably what a lot of people are interested in because that's where the real gap goes um, unmet. 
And those are the little projects that are typically less than 10 units. They're normally financed with home or housing trust funds. And again, a lot of times it's most desirable to have them as a community partnership. And, and what I mean by community partnerships is that most all of the, I'll call them government programs, really encourage some investment at the local level in order to access their resources. And, and honestly, the way things are so expensive now, it's really, it's really almost necessary. And so community partnerships that we've done, it, um, the types of things that has come through is um, donation of land that maybe a county or a city owns and they're willing to donate to a nonprofit in order to make that, um, some affordable housing happen in their communities. Um, in their community, Valley County had a seven acre parcel of land that they donated to IHSA to donate to the housing company. In 2007, I believe it was, that we um, built 72 units on in, in the city of McCall. Um, the city of Nez Perce, and I'll talk about this project more specific um, later on, but the city of Nez Perce um, donated some, some lots for some single-family homes as well as water sewer hookups and some of their um, building permit fees. Um, some communities do it through, and this is a larger community thing, probably do it through TIF, district, TIF districts, tax increment financing. Um, some communities do it through their economic development um, agencies or their urban renewal agencies to um, donate money or help with the acquisition of a building or land to make, um, to make a project happen. But that's kind of what I'm talking about as far as community partnerships go. Are they ever privately owned yes. housing? Yes. Sometimes they're IHFA, or I'm sorry, the housing company owned. Sometimes they're managed by you. To, yes. Sometimes they're privately. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sometimes, and they go through the same process of applying. Yes. All, 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 all developers or private entities go through the same process of applying for the resources. It's a very objective process. It's all done by a scoring matrix. There's no subjectiveness about it as far as um, a resource committee picking one project over another. It's all, it's the points. Do it's priority the, counties just automatically score higher? Two more points. Oh, mm -hmm. They get two points for a priority county. So, so yes, that's a, that's a great question. So, and then, and then another thing that's a lot of times <clears throat> used, and, and in the communities that I work in, we deal with a lot of NIMBYism, not in my backyard. Um, everybody always wants affordable housing in their communities, excepting for the citizens that the affordable housing is going next to. <laughs> and I am out there all the time um, at ribbon cuttings for our own properties, at city council meetings, talking to community groups, because affordable housing is not what you think it is. It's not what it used to be. It's not the old um, projects um, like a lot of people think it is. And, and, and this is one of the reasons why. So I commonly get when we're going into a community to build um, an apartment property and typically one of the larger ones. So 35 units, 40 units, 50 units, something like that. Um, I get some community opposition, and they always say, well, we don't want that subsidized housing. We don't want Section 8 housing. Well, Section 8 housing, Section 8 project-based housing is something that does not exist anymore. Um, that is the subsidized housing that you think of. It was used to build most of the housing until 1983 when it was replaced by the low-income housing tax credit. The property has project-based assistance from HUD that pays the tenants' rents above 30% of their income. So if I am, and it serves the very low income, so if I am a low-income person and I walk in the door of a Section 8 property and I um, income qualify and I move in there, I only pay 30% of my income. So let's just say, and I'm going to give a hypothetical here, and, and my example is going to work both for the um, Section 8 project based assistance and the Section 8 housing choice voucher. And I'm going over this just to be clear so that um, so there's not confusion about this because I see that there's this is out there a lot when it comes to new affordable housing. So if 
if I have uh, $500 a month income in Social Security, let's just say, and so 30% so of that is $150 a month. So HUD says that I am able to pay $150 a month for my housing, which is rent plus utilities. So say HUD has determined that at this particular apartment property, the fair market rents, and HUD determines these, the fair market rents are $500 for this unit that I want to live in. And so HUD says that you have to pay $50 for your utilities and $100 for your rent, and then I will pay, HUD will pay the other $400 for, for the rent. So if I make $500 a month, I, live in, I move into the apartment, I pay my $50 utility bill, I pay $100 to the landlord for my rent, and then HUD sends a check for the other $400. That's the project-based assistance and it always stays with the property. It's not the possession of the residents. That was eventually seen um, by housing advocates as concentrating poverty in a single area because you had these sometimes large projects that had all these very low income people in it. And so as time went on, people um, started to realize that mixed income housing was a much healthier and better um, way for people to live. And so they, they stopped the housing uh, project-based housing in 1983, and they started to replace that with, with the low-income housing tax credit and with the Section 8 project, um, and with the Section 8 housing choice voucher. So now, Idaho Housing and Finance, Pocatello Neighborhood Housing, and Boise City Ada County Housing get housing choice vouchers, and the tenant or the resident applies to IHFA to get the portable portable voucher, and they can take it around and get any housing that they like. And as long as the landlord will accept the voucher, um, they can move in there. So it could be an apartment, it could be a single family home, it could be a duplex, it could be anything. As long as the landlord will accept the voucher, they can go anywhere they would like with their voucher. Um, and it was, like I said, started as a way to spread mixed income housing. Um, out so so um, can any landlord sorry Helena, any landlord can, can accept, accept a voucher, a voucher. Mm -hmm. you just have to be willing willing to do it that should be under a certain criteria right for the specific yes. house it can't be a yes so so the other thing with a with the project based or with I'm sorry with the housing choice voucher is if I'm a recipient and I get a voucher and I go out and I find a house and the landlord is willing to rent to me and accept my voucher. The voucher, um, the, the voucher um, agency, so like IHFA, has inspectors that go out and inspect the housing and make sure that it's not substandard housing. And if the housing is substandard, you know, that they would not let you rent in that place. So so they do they do monitor that pretty pretty well that, that there's not basically slum slumlords out there. Is it, are there a max on like, I mean, if it's a $3,000 a month? Yes, house, yes, they have they, maximums. Okay. What HUD, HUD calls them FMRs, fair market rents, and so okay. you have a range, yeah, yes. Sure you have a range. Yeah, they won't pay the difference of $100 to $3,000 on, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, they might if you're in New York City or yeah, something like that. Right. Yeah, depending on where you're at, but in Idaho, um, that, that wouldn't happen. Um, can I just interrupt for a second? Uh -huh. I forgot to remind everybody that if you have questions, please type them in as you have them, and Catherine will get to them as they come up. Yeah, I'm always happy to engage in dialogue or answer anybody's questions. I think that makes for a greater, um, greater interactive um, learning experience. So, yeah, so if anybody has a question, just type it on there and stop me, and I'll try to explain something <coughs> better or stop rambling on so much about something. Um, so these are some of the affordable um, housing funding sources that are out there. Neighborhood stabilization funds um, were part of the um, the um, the act that President Obama had during the bad downturn, when there was a lot of foreclosed and blighted homes around, particularly home neighborhoods in like Detroit that were basically foreclosed on, owned by the bank, vacant and deteriorating. And those are loan funds that are that um, 
that um, developers or or um, or uh, participants can apply for, and they are used to purchase, rehabilitate, and rent or sell foreclosed and blighted homes. Not just any home; have to be bank-owned home, a home that's not in foreclosure, but a bank-owned or or blighted home. And that program serves home buyers. Um, at 120% or less of area median income. And I have a, the next slide is gonna talk about and show some area median income so that if you don't know what that is, we'll talk about that a little bit. Home Fund is, is a, a funding source that we use a lot, especially for the smaller rural um, properties. And those are loan funds used to finance rentals or for sale homes for individuals and families with median incomes at or less than 80% of area median income. Housing Trust Funds, or HTF, is a new program that the state of Idaho got $3.5 million um, in funds for that is used to finance rental homes for individuals and families with median incomes at or less than 30% of AMI. So that's the very, very low, um, low rents. And then the low income housing tax credit, which produces the bulk of the affordable housing around the country and in the state of Idaho. And those are awarded to, like I said, larger rental projects that serve individuals and families at 60% or less of area median income. And like I explained, they provide a source of equity that can be used to leverage other uh, sources of funding. So this is HUD, the HUD income limit table for 2017 for Lewis County. And I put this up here because we did, I'm gonna talk about um, the single family homes that we did in Nez Perce here, here in just a minute. But, um, HUD publishes the income limit each year for counties um, around the state of Idaho, um, around the country. And these are the guidelines that properties that are um, affordable housing properties um, um, use when they income qualify their residents to move in. And it's all based on a person, um, on a household size. So for example, if I ha am a single person and I make, let's just say 50% of the area median income for Lewis County, I would make $19,350 or less. If I had um, a husband and two children or, a, or any kind of a family of four, I would make $27,600 or less in order to live in that. Um, in that unit. And usually there's the, the properties, the larger property, properties are mixed income. So when we develop a tax credit property, we have units for 30% AMI, 40% AMI, 50% AMI, 60%, and usually a few market rate units because um, the program incents you to have um, at least 10% market rate units again because they communities are healthier if they're mixed income. So the single family homes that we did in Nez Perce, in 2014 and 2015, the housing company partnered with the city of Nez Perce. Uh, Mayor Steve Bateman called us um, and uh, just reached out in a phone conversation and said, hey, would you be interested in coming up to, to Nez Perce and talking to us about housing. We haven't had, and I don't quote me on this, but I can't remember, I think it was like, we haven't had a new um, house built here other than like a custom homeowner build that I'm talking about, a, house, a new house for sale, built here in like 10 or 15 years. It's been a really long time. And they had a thriving business that was in the city of Nez Perce, Hilco, that um, makes an attachment to a combine that is um, leveling for um, crops on the Palouse and actually sell them to other countries around the world as, as well. So, so they had a real need in that community. The city donated three lots. They donated their water sewer hookup fees and part of their building permit fees to facilitate us building three homes in that community that were, would be for sale. 
And so we built three three bedroom, two bath homes, 1,250 square feet um, that were sold to home buyers in the area. Um, IHSA assisted with some down payment um, assistance that anybody could get, not just for this project, but there are down payment assistance programs um, out there that IHSA manages. And the homes were priced at $120,000. $120, Looks like there's a question. Uh, where can I find the AMI for the county by chart? Okay, so you can go on um, um, novoco.com, N O V O C O.com. It's a company called Novogratis, and you can go on there and um, go to their um, Affordable Housing Resource Center, I think it's called, and navigate your way to, um, to uh, the rent and income calculator. And so if you type your county in there, um, and you don't have to put in any rents in there or any or any unit types or anything, and just hit, um, hit, hit the button, I can't remember what it's called, they'll pop up. You could also get them from HUD's website, and so you could go on HUD and do a search for um, income limits for your county, or you could do a, a Google search HUD HUD area median income limits for whatever county you're for, but there there are several different places that you can access them. And if you have any trouble, I have my contact information out on the last slide, and um, Jenny and Amanda could also send out my contact information. I've given it to them. Just call me or email me anytime, and I can look them up for you and send you a link. I'm happy to do that. It takes me about two seconds because I'm used to doing it. <laughs> A question. Uh -huh. How do tenants qualify for vouchers? So to qualify for vouchers, they would go to their a local public housing authority. So in Pocatello, it's Pocatello Neighborhood Housing Services in the city of Pocatello. In Ada County, it's Boise City Ada County Housing. And then anywhere else in the state, it's Idaho Housing and Finance Association. And you contact them, and you um, get on their voucher waiting list. Oh, there's a waiting. Uh huh. There's a waiting list, and the waiting list, depending on where you are in the state, is anywhere from two to three years. Uh -huh. Idaho, Idaho has gets about 3,500 vouchers, and I think all those vouchers are subscribed. Plus, there's like 4,600 people on the waiting list. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's huge. It's huge. Because I think it's like college students would qualify, right? No. Because income, right? No. 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 Okay, so so there is a student rule. Oh. And don't quote me on vouchers because I don't work with vouchers. I, I work with more with ta tax credits and stuff. But students do not qualify. And the reason is, is because they could be from a wealthy family oh. or, as was a controversial issue quite a number of years ago, a senator's child in, I think, was the state of Illinois that was living in affordable housing and was the child of a, of a, of a U.S. Senator. So there is a student rule, and, and so students do not qualify to live in, in, in most of the programs. Again, don't quote me on voucher, but um, unless they meet the student rule. And the student rule is um, that they're completely emancipated from their family and they file an independent tax return and they're um, married um, there's several different rules, um, but um, but they're pretty strict on on making sure that a student of a family of means doesn't qualify. I mean, it is possible for like an emancipated single mom who's trying to go to school and work a job. You know, there's there's ways they can they can get in, but I could find out the exact um, the exact rule for you if you're interested in that. But there are student rules. So we have another question. Can developers put part of their development project into affordable housing along with their higher end development? Yes, they can. They can. And actually that <coughs> is, that is encouraged um, as a way to um, to incorporate all housing types. Um, they call um, HUD has what they call um, areas of opportunity, and that is higher income areas that they have a concerted effort to try to get um, affordable housing into because they're wanting to make sure communities are integrated. So yes, developers can put part of their development in affordable housing and then part of their development in higher end development. Sometimes you'll see 
not so much in Idaho, but in um, um, more expensive areas, you know, like um, California or New York or Boston, places like that, where you'll have um, a multi-story building that will have affordable housing on the lower floors, and then maybe some very high condos for sale on the top floors, uh, high-end condos for sale, even multi-million dollar ones. And, and some of those high-end sales or rentals can help to pay for some of the more affordable housing that might be in another area of the development. So that's very encouraged. I have a question. So if there are 3,500 vouchers in Idaho in a mm -hmm. given year, there's 4,000 on the wait list, mm -hmm. and it's two to three years, that's telling me that you're turning through these people. Mm -hmm. um, is that a good thing? Because, I mean, ideally, getting them affordable mm -hmm. housing should help them get jobs and mm -hmm. exactly. sustain them themselves. Is that what you see as kind of the the pathway, like get on it for two to three years and mm -hmm. then we want you to come off it or is there long term? Right. And 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 that would be a better question for the people who deal with the, the vouchers, vouchers at IHFA mm -hmm. for specifics on that. But just generally, yes, the goal of people either in the project based Section 8 housing or on housing choice vouchers is to get them to be self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. And so there's a variety of things. Some people stay on them for ever and are multi-generational even and some people hit a hit a rough patch they're lucky enough to get in the housing or get a voucher they participate in a family self-sufficiency program of which ihfa has and they they work um they help them go through uh, um, you know uh, uh, the program and they they get they get education they work on their budgets they they work on all kinds of things and they get off they get they get into conventional housing. And we have um, quite a few people that transition out of our Section 8 housing and a lot out of our tax credit housing into home ownership. Yeah. So I'm just going to run through a few pictures of the houses in Nez Perce. Um, we built three. Each of them had the same floor plan with different, a um, little bit different elevations, but they were three bedroom, two bath, uh, 1,250 square feet, um, two car garage. You can see the inside, each of the exteriors have a little different elevation and a little bit different color. There was a tan, a red, and a green, and then the, all the interiors were different. There was a white, um, there was a white interior, a kitchen pantry, arched entryways. Um, there was like an espresso interior, um, and I don't think I have a picture. There was kind of a medium, sort of a medium colored cabinetry interior. Nice. That's a really nice. Bath. That's a secondary bedroom. It has a window seat and then a, a tub shower combo. Um, so building off of that, um, that project in in Nez Perce, of which we really appreciated um, Mayor Bateman's Mayor Bateman's assistance with, um, the housing company applied for and was awarded um, funds in 2017 from the Home and the Housing Trust Fund allocation to build 10 rental units. And so we are going to build 10 three-bedroom, two-bath, 1,250 square foot homes. They're very similar in the floor plan to the homes um, that I just um, showed you in Nez Perce. And we're doing it as a pilot project, and we're building the first ones in CUNA with the hope that we can replicate the program in areas around the state. And we're going to do something different than we haven't done before, and we are going to try to build them in mo as modulars. And we've so so the floor plans have changed a little bit because we had to build them um, within um, what the modular box parameters were. But um, modular construction is getting to be quite popular. And it's not, again, it's not what you picture in the old um, the manufactured housing or um, the, trailer, the trailers that came before that. And that modular construction is starting to be used for multi-story apartments, for hotels. I think there's two hotels that are going up in, in the valley here in Boise um, that are modulars. And they're basically building them in boxes, and then you you um, uh, um, either attach them side by side or front back. You stack them. Um, you do a variety of things. And we are building our roofs on site so that we have uh, like a 612 roof, roof pitch, which I don't think you'll even know they're modular units at that point. 
And the reason we're doing this is because it's been very difficult um, to build in some of the rural communities, um, uh, limited access communities around the state. And so we're hoping that with having a modular unit that we can um, have already pre-designed, we know how much it costs, it's a known pricing model, they're very efficient, energy efficient products when they come out of the factory. You have a shortened construction um, time frame for the harsher climates, the mountain climates, where you can double track your site work and your um, factory production and, um, and, and get units um, delivered and built in some of the um, overlooked communities around the state where there's a lack of, a lack of trade. So we're hoping to um, put our first modular units on the production line by the end of January and have them done um, second quarter of 2018. And I'm hoping that um, through this process, we'll um, be able to, to get a replicable model that we can build around the state like we did in Nez Perce, but it'll be a little bit, a little bit easier to access um, trades, especially um, in the time frame that we're in right now in that contractors are so hard to come by and it's really, really difficult to get contractors, even in a good market, in places like Stanley or Wei or Ms. Purse or Cottonwood or, or some of those places. So I will keep everybody posted on on how that goes. But I'm I'm crossing my fingers that this won't be just a one-off deal that we do in CUNA. Um, that we that we're not able to do again, but that we really get something dialed down and and we can um, talk to some of the communities around the state and 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 replicate it. So finally, I was going to talk about um, just a couple of the of the more unconventional and interesting things that that we're doing. And again, you can ask questions anytime. But um, um, about 10 years ago, we did um, historic rehabilitation and adaptive reuse of the old Whitman Hotel in Pocatello. It was um, a building that was built in 1913, 1914. It was a very significant landmark in the city of Pocatello, um, an important building to their, um, to their community. A lot of people had gone to proms, uh, et cetera, in that building, and it had been um, um, empty for about 20 years when we when we got a hold of it it was just filled with pigeons and and, and garbage and it had actually been condemned um, at one point and we were able to go in and um, work with the Pocatello Development Authority that it, who is the urban renewal agency in Pocatello they they put in funds and helped us with that building and you can see the before picture on the left and then the after picture on the right, we used um, low income housing tax credits and historic tax credits in order to rehabilitate that building. It's commercial space on the first floor and then three floors of affordable housing on the, on the third, uh, second, third, and fourth floors. It's um, 25 units. And since it's, been, um, since it's been open, it is full all the time. It has brought people back to downtown Pocatello and instead of just having people there from nine to five on Monday through Friday, um, it spurred additional economic development in the city of Pocatello and I think it's been a really great thing. Um, you can see um, this is just some pictures of the lobby chandelier restoration um, that happened. Um, the University of Idaho did the restoration on the um, I'm sorry, not the University of Idaho. I'm sorry to anyone in Pocatello. <laughs> Idaho State University did the um, restoration of the old chandeliers that are in that building. Um, you can see those pictures um, that are from the area. We took those down, um, had them cleaned and digitally reproduced, and we put the reproductions back up in the new restored lobby. And we donated all the original photographs to the um, Bannock County Historical Museum. Um, you can see the old light well on the left, full of pigeon poo, and, and then the new light well on the right, which um, is a nice place for residents to sit and have coffee or, or, or whatever. It um, has a glass roof on it, so you can access it 12 months of the year. 
um, just a few rehabilitation um, things. We restored the old Whitman sign and rehung it on the back of the building. We took off a lot of the old. Um, over the years, a lot of um, elements had been put on. We worked with the State Historic Preservation Office and the United of the National Park Service to do all of this. You can see the brick cleaning on the left is the clean brick, and the right is the the old dirty brick. Uh, wow. New um, windows to match the historic windows that were in there. And this is the new basement with the exercise room, bike storage, um, a laundry facility, um, the old second floor lobby on the left, and then that upper right corner is the new second floor lobby for the housing. Wow. And then an old kitchen and a new kitchen. And an old hotel bathroom and a new bathroom. And the old lobby and the new lobby on the right. With the, with the restored chandeliers and then the restored pictures. How? When was this completed? When did start, people start living it, there? It, 2008. Oh, a while. Okay, mm -hmm. wow. 2008. So yeah, it's been about nine or ten years um, since we did that. I think we started the rehabilitation in um, in um, 2007. Um, so we have a question. Can a small rural, rural community do restoration to a building if they don't have a housing home? So the answer to that is yes. You just would need to find somebody who, um, somebody like the housing company or another um, developer that um, has some expertise in historic restoration if that's what you want to do and work with them to see if your um, project might be viable. I know I've been um, talking a lot to um, Julia Oxarongo with um, Lincoln County. Yeah, Lincoln County about some old buildings that they have in Shoshone. She's a really good advocate for her community and is um, very active in trying to make things happen in her community. And and yes, if you can make the you know if, if you can work with with somebody and you can make the numbers work, yes, absolutely, that's a possibility. So, so a current project that we have going on and we hope to start next year is the old Bonneville Hotel in Idaho Falls. We have been working with the Idaho Falls Urban Renewal Agency um, and the city of Idaho Falls. They're making a significant commitment to the old Bonneville Hotel that's right downtown in Idaho Falls across the street from the city hall to, um, to rehabilitate the Bonneville Hotel with commercial space on the first floor and then four um, levels of uh, affordable housing on the, the stories above. So um, this is the old hotel uh, postcard of what it looked like um, somewhere in its early days. Um, the old lobby, what it looks like today. You can see there's been a lot of billboards and the corner of it is the old storefront's been covered up by some stone and and um, some uh, uh, antennas and stuff have been put on the top of it. The brick is dirty. The inside is, is pretty dilapidated. And so, um, again, we're working with Idaho Falls. Um, we have um, that building under, under site control. We've applied for um, historic tax credits and low-income housing tax credits, and uh, as well as some other um, funds to be able to do that building. And we hope to do uh, start next spring with 35 to do 35 units in that building. Wow. Um, can the city use the main floor of a restored building for their offices and the upstairs in the housing? Are there funds to help with this if it is a downtown core and historic building? So yes, they can. And so what we do um, with buildings like this and what you would probably need to do in, uh, to do that, um, one, one thing is that the housing, the city could be a tenant um, and the the company that owns the housing could be the landlord, or you could condominiumize the building. And this is what we did in um, Pocatello at the Whitman, and this is what we plan to do here. And one condominium is all the upper floors with the housing. So that's one condominium. And then the ground floor retail is a separate condominium, and that condominium unit with the ground floor city offices say could be sold to the city um, and yes there 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 is funds to help um, 
with historic rehabilitation. I'm not sure about the, um, if you're talking about is there funds to help <coughs> do the office space, um, construct the office space in the downtown core. I'm not sure about that because I, I'm an affordable housing person. Um, so I'm not sure if there's funds to, to do that, but most definitely um, there's funds to do the historic part of it. So you'd be left with a shell that you would you could build out. So that is, I think, my last slide. That um, oh no, I have a few. So this is the inside of the Bonneville right now. What it looks like. Um, uh, it has been being used as kind of single room occupancy or kind of transient housing the last few years. And then this is a rendering of what we hope to have it look like in the future if we get our funding. Cool. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah, fingers crossed. We should know by the end of the year. So anyway, that is my contact information. And I love to talk to communities. So if anybody has questions or just wants to bat around ideas, or wants to find out who to talk to about a certain um, question that I can't help you on, just email me or call me. Um, I'm usually around. Awesome. Thank you. I don't see any questions up there right now, so maybe people are curious if I can <laughs> <laughs> try to get them in. Um, does anyone in here have any other questions? That was incredibly yeah. informative. Yeah, Thank sure. you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, and we will certainly send people your way if they okay. have any questions. I sure appreciate you joining us today. Um, welcome. Yeah. I don't it's see my you pleasure. Right here. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating. If you would like to access this recording, please um, get a hold of me, Amanda Ames, at Commerce, or really anyone here. We, we can get it to you. Um, and with that, we will um, talk to you next time. Thank you.